Ladies and gentlemen, oh, let's go. Holla, holla. Level up. Love Wellness. Level up. Level up. Damn good time. Level up. Level up. Level up. Level up. Level up. Level up. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Hit it. You're listening to the Holistic Life Podcast, presented by Say What Radio. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Bow to <tickle> well. <laughs> Welcome to the Holistic Life Show. I, you know, I, she sets it up every time and I'm still not ready for it. <laughs> I always catch him off guard. Never, I'm Jenny. <laughs> never ready for it. I'm Jay. And we are super excited as we are fluster clucked today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been fun, but you know what? Oh, man. You're in for a treat because you know that we don't bring on guests very often, but when we do, we make sure that they are badass bitches. But this person's <laughs> not a badass bitch. This person's just a badass. I am so excited to bring on Ryan Bennett. I have to because I was like, oh, I don't want to read like a real like bio, but like his bio is so cool. I'm going to read parts of it, right? So he is a high performance coach, author, and speaker who guides people to reach their full potential in their lives, businesses, and teams through his proven method of intentional growth. This is the part I thought was badass. Well, that's badass, but this is badass too. So as a former ESPN academic All-American, what? He channeled his competitiveness from baseball, speaking my language, to business by founding a startup company in Silicon Valley. So we are going to talk about all kinds of cool shit. Today's episode is about innovation. Ryan has all kinds of innovation in his life. He's got all kinds of cool gems that you're going to be able to take into yours. So welcome, Ryan. Gems as in jewels. Jewels. Not not the workout place. Gems. That's right. Hey, Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Guys, I'm excited to be here. You two are hilarious. You had <laughs> no idea what you signed up for, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I sort of did from the intro call, though. Uh, that was hilarious. Good. good point. <laughs> yeah, we had a blast. They made friends. They bonded for life, which, mind you, I mean, just as a quick catch up, we talked about baseball. I mean, you play baseball. We talked about baseball. And of course, our team, the Tampa Bay Rays, is in the World Series. Rays up. Sorry, Houston. And we are split in the series 1-1. I didn't watch the first one because we were doing something. But my thing is, like, the Rays have to score early, you know, get that momentum going because the Dodgers are a good team. And it's just – I think it's going to be, like, back and forth for the whole series. That's that's my two cents. What do you think ESPN academic all-star baseball turned into business? <laughs> I love rooting for the, the teams with, with the small market, small market teams with the smaller budget. So I, I'm like all about the Rays because from Kansas City, the Royals are like that kind of team where we never could afford the good players. And when they're good, right. they have to leave. So I'm all about the Rays and small ball that they do really well. See, we're saying that's all you have to do to get on the podcast is agree with the baseball team we like. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Please do not send us tons of emails about how much you love the Rays <laughs> and you want a spot on the podcast. You also have to be awesome. So Ryan, just talk a little bit about yourself. You know, I mean, I, I was looking at your book, the intentional day, and I think the opening sentence, I want to hear about this. Like, I want to hear a little bit more about your story and the opening sentence about what your goals were in 2011. Oh yeah, please. That was awesome. Yeah. I was a wonderful person back then. I got to tell you. <laughs> no. So like the opening line is actually really funny. My wife still cracks up about it, but every year it comes to my Facebook timeline. And in 2011, my goal actually was to watch more TV. And that was like what I was setting out to do in life, watching more TiVo. And that just shows you how far off I was from where I wanted to be and where I'm at now. So <laughs> that was the beginning of my journey to where I am today, helping people. So I want to go into that a little bit, right? Because if someone's in that mode, they might not feel like they're far off. So go into that a little bit about why that was so far off and why that was so misaligned and how we can become more intentional. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. Yeah, uh, right. I'll go, go into bite size. For me, so like context to what happened there was let me give you a brief history of like how I got to that point of wanting to watch more TV as a goal, which is crazy. <laughs> what kind of person was I? But uh, anyways, <laughs> after college, I had that competitive itch. So I kind of dove in and I wanted to challenge myself somewhere else. And so I had, a, I had a business background. So I decided to do a startup in Silicon Valley. And so, you know, it packed a U-Haul up, moved out to Silicon Valley and recruited a team and Unfortunately, over two and a half years, 
I became a statistic hmm. and I had to shut down that business and let my team go. And it was really sad. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I learned a lot from it, but it still was a sad failure and, and drove back home with the tail between my legs back to Kansas city into my parents' basement at age 27, completely flat broke. Mm. And so at that moment, you know, that's when I started reflecting on life and started to realize in that the same kind of disciplines and habits I put in the baseball field, I needed to take to the professional world, but I didn't know how. So that was, that was kind of where this moment was in 2011 for me. And before I had that realization of what, where I needed to go, I sort of just was in a funk and I don't think you, I don't think it was an de- actual depression. You know, I don't think it was that deep, but it was a funk because in the first time in my life, like I failed at something and I also had no direction of where I wanted to go as, as athletes. I know you guys can relate to this is that you always have something you're moving towards, right? There's always mm-hmm. an off season, then there's a season and then there's an off season where you work again to get ready for the season. Right. And then all of a sudden, right after that, for me, I trailed right into business, which was like, go, go, go. And then everything just crumbled. And so I was emotionally drained, just tired. And that was kind of the point in my life where I was at. And I, I, thought, I finally saw myself gaining about 15, 20 pounds. I started going to the bars more often, started dating girls I shouldn't be dating. And that was like right when I set that goal of like, I just wanted to watch TV. Like hmm. That's what I wanted mm-hmm. to do. And a little bit after that is where I kind of had that look in the mirror where you're like, wait a minute. I used to be an academic All-American. Now I'm like, going to bars, gaining weight. Like, I don't want to be that person. That's not me. Right. How do I get back to me? Which was the question I had to ask myself. And I had no idea how to get there. And that was started this whole journey of figuring out how to grow and how to apply the things I learned from the baseball field into the real world. But that was kind of like that, that mindset of where I was at when I set that goal, that crazy goal of watching more TV. I feel like there's a lot of people who are potentially at that spot that you were, right? Like, with 2020 and everything that's come and everything that has presented itself and all the different challenges and obstacles, I feel like there's a lot of people who are feeling something very similar. Like, okay, what just happened? What do I want? Who am I? And finding themselves obviously with more free time. So it is easy to have TiVo, which I don't even know if TiVo is still around, but the point is, you know, like Netflix and just like cross off your to-do list via Netflix shows. Mm, I would agree to disagree. I think the thing is people don't ask themselves that important question. Like, how do I get back to me? Like, this has been Mm. a major interrupt, like worldwide interrupt. So it's like you're forced into this. I don't want to say new normal, but this new thing, you know, everything that you've been used to doing has been you, you, not necessarily can't do, but it's like very, definitely more restrictive, if not by state mandates, by social mandates, people policing people, families, friends, all these lines being drawn. And I think we should be asking ourselves that question. How do I get back to me? Which dives kind of into who am I? Yeah, what, like, what do you do you have a certain process for that, Ryan? Or did you just follow it intuitively? Like, how did you really ask those questions to get back to you and to be able to connect to being intentional. I mean, that was like a, it's like a five-year journey for me. You know, it was just like, who am I? And you know, the identity of myself was always an athlete. Right. I don't think I ever actually changed my identity even doing the startup. And so all of a sudden I was a startup entrepreneur who was like driven and all this stuff. And I was a, an athlete and I was driven all this stuff and then everything left. Right. It's all gone. Right. Right. And then all of a sudden you're considered a failure by the outside world mm-hmm. because your business wasn't a success. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, so you weren't, you rather me go work for a really large company and just like rise through the ranks mm-hmm. than like try to go actually do something special and create something normal. Right. And so anyways, I think part of that is, is understanding that my identity was, had to change a little bit of who I was. And I was searching like, okay, who is Ryan? Like, what do I enjoy? But I think what I had to start by going to, which is like, what, where do I actually want to go five years from now? Mm. Who do I want to be? What kind of life do I want to live? What's really important to me? And to me, that was like, you know, having healthy lifestyle right. and freedom of wealth, which means you could be rich, you could not, but having the choice to do what I mm-hmm. want to do with my time right. and, I, you know, having good relationships with my family. And, and I was single at the time. Now I'm married, but it was like, I want a wife. I want a family. I want kids. And so I sort of had to just like go back to that very beginning of like, gosh, let me go away for a weekend or a day and like dream right. of who do I actually want to 
be because I'm not sure I've ever asked that question. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's interesting. Definitely, definitely interesting. And most people experience this in this this microwave society that we live in, especially the people mm-hmm. who've been in college, the athletes who, you know what I'm saying, their life has been around the sports. You've gotten a ride for school. Then you graduate. But your your career path isn't in sports. You know, you have to go to the corporate world or you're doing entrepreneurship. But it's a whole different thing. But it's it's a whole set of rules. And if all you've known is like the, the sports thing, you have to play by a whole set of rules. And I'm thinking back to when I moved to Florida from Houston and for like nine months, first nine months here, like you said, I, I gained almost 40 pounds. You know, I was I was depressed. I didn't even realize I was depressed. But looking back, like some of the pictures, it's like, yo, who the hell is this dude? Right. And it was like, OK, I'm almost pushing 250. I've never been 250. So you kind of go into, holy shit, I need to work out more. I need to eat better. All this stuff that society says works. Right. But in doing that, none of that worked for me. But then it was like. That was never my goal. Even when I worked out, when I was training, when I was teaching, my goal wasn't to lose weight. My goal was to go in the gym or wherever I was and basically kick the shit out of that workout, no matter what it was. And like from that came the looking lean, you know what I'm saying? The being stronger, but that wasn't the aim. The aim wasn't, oh my God, I need to lose weight. You know, it was just kind of a byproduct. So I I love that. How you said, like, I just needed to go away, like separate because society will kick you in the neck. Make sure I said neck because I apparently pronounced that wrong yesterday on a phone call. We'll kick you in the neck and have you feeling like you're worthless. You know, you have to to get away sometimes for family, friends. And when you're trying to take you, your business or your dreams to another level, you have to separate yourself from some of those people because, Some of those people, although as much as you may love them, they can't even put themselves in the realm of where you are, where you want to go, you know? So it's like trying to talk to your best friend who's done nothing but worked at a nine to five his whole life and telling them you're building a company from the ground up, you know? I gotta tell you, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. You're crazy. Like, why would you want to do that? Because they don't know the experience of that. They don't know the experience. So I love how you said you had to get away and just start dreaming again. Like that is super important. There's actually science to that. It's called visualization. And so what the, what the science would tell you, the psychology would tell you is that like part of that dreaming process. Now I'm not talking about like the secret where you put in the universe right. and it comes right. back to you. But what I'm talking about is like when, when you dream, your brain actually creates some neural pathways to start to shape how it looks like to walk out that, that goal. Hmm. And so it's your brain actually gets behind you and starts to, when you dream in vivid detail, your brain actually starts to look at like, how do I efficiently get to that path? How do I officially hit that goal? And they start to help you. That's awesome. And so, yeah, it's great emotionally for me. Like I do it actually every year. It's emotionally, it's really great for me, but also there's, there's actually some psychology and science around it too. So that's what I had to do, you know? And I think for me was the part where, yeah, I wanted to do all these things. I wanted to accomplish all these things and do all these things. But that's always the scoreboard. Mm. I needed to get myself stable back to who Ryan is first. Because I can't, you can't build a skyscraper without going deep <laughs> right. and building the foundation, right? And so for me, I had to figure out, okay, I need to understand my emotions more. I need to understand where I'm at. I need to understand like how to communicate better. I need to understand like all these things that are beneath the surface. Right. So that was like where I was at. And I don't know if you related the same, Jay, when you moved to Tampa Bay. Yeah, man. After, like you said, when you reach that point where you're like, holy shit, this isn't me. You got to dive deeper. You got to dive deeper to foundation. You say foundation, like family, friends, everything was back in Texas. You're starting all over. And it's like, what do I really want from this? Like, what is around? What is this experience? Like, what do I want to create? What is this? Like you said, that, that life, what do you want out of life? What do you want out of life? And then like you said, dreaming bigger. And once you start doing that, like you said, tapping into that mental power, because our brains are super awesome. Like <laughs> we can start thinking about stuff like that. And you say stuff starts to happen. You don't have to understand why you don't under- have to understand how, but stuff starts to happen. And once you go there, it's definitely a, a different type of energy, definitely a different type of energy. Jenny, did you have an, ex- like, did you 
feel that when you're done playing sports, did you have that like identity crisis that Jay and I have, or, or how is that what for, for women? How is that? What's that experience like? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny as you were talking about that, I actually still identify as an athlete and I think it's, it's come around in a lot of different ways. I actually had an episode on the life of Ventures podcast about the life of a bench warmer, which I think is very similar to what you were talking about when you failed in your business, right? Like I've been inducted in two Hall of Fames for softball and played three sports was not always good because in the beginning I sucked, but I worked hard at it and I was good. I had a lot of achievements graduating college and going into the workforce. I was a top sales professional. Like it was always about the achievement and the go, go, go. And then, you know, like having for sake of better terms, like it's like that, that failure moment of being a bench warmer. I had never experienced that before and it was so tough. And so I find it interesting because for me, the tapping into the athlete aspect of life is so important to me because it's what keeps me staying active. It's what continues to drive me, but also realizing and disconnecting from the ego, right? And and stepping away from the ego aspect of wanting to be the best athlete still. I mean, I still want to be and I have to like back up from that because there's other goals I want to do. I have to like step back. So I think that for me, that's what it's the way that it's shown up. And even from the outside, like I I have given up sports to pursue my dreams, but then that came at the detriment of my health because it became an all or nothing approach. So I'm probably still in that process, to be honest, because I'm still very, very tied to it it a little bit. As with anything else. We're individuals. Yeah. So certain things work for certain people. And there's something about that that aspect of being an athlete that you connect with that helps you with other things in your life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, I don't think it ever leaves you. No, 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 de- definitely not. <laughs> because like for me, when I had to get back to who Ryan was, it actually was getting back to who Ryan was as an athlete. Hmm. And then taking that bridge to say, okay, now how do I apply those great things to the professional world? So to me, it was, it wasn't the identity around the athlete, but it was like all the things that I enjoyed as an athlete right. and that I resonate with that you tie now get to business. apply it. Yeah. yeah. Actually like that's who I, it's actually who I am. I've been an athlete my whole life because I played pickup basketball in the neighborhood growing right. up as right. a five-year-old, you know, all the way up to, you know, after college. So I don't think it leaves you. It wasn't like tied to the athlete thing, but it's, it's those things those attributes, those qualities that made you a good athlete that you had to apply to business and in life. It's like, Ooh, well said. It's, it's kind of like not sports, not baseball, not basketball, whatever, because you've got inducted into uh, two Hall of Fames because of the type of player yeah, you were. It's so not true. because of the sport. Right. And it's just like taking those same attributes and applying them to your life as a whole. Right. Like weightlifting. It's not like, oh, I can lift heavy. It's like the mindset behind going into whatever workout you did and just applying that Mm -hmm. to anything else. And I feel like with you, Ryan, one of the things that seems to be really standing out as a theme in this part of the conversation, because I'm sure you can go so deep and we could probably talk for multiple hours, right? But like the thing that's standing out to me is like, the going of the deep, the asking the questions, the intention behind things. Yeah. I mean, granted, that's that's the name of your book, you know, the the intentional day. Because, like, I feel like a lot of us make goals, right? Especially when you're having this, like, inner transformation where you've hit a point and you have to ask those questions, like, what do I want? And sometimes we look externally for the goals. We look for other people to dictate the goals, whether it's through our career, our family, our surrounding society, Oh, you have to have a house by this age. You have to have kids by this age. You have to, right? Like those types of things. I really want to like hear what you have to say because I want to hear the deeper side, right? So it's like you're making this change. You're doing these things. And especially, shoot, we're coming out of like for what has been a tough year for a lot of people. And shoot, you can look back in history. There's lots of tough years, but 2020 has been tough. We've got 2021 around the corner. And shoot, you can, it doesn't matter. This is timeless information. So it's not just related to the turn of a year. But I feel like a lot of people are going to be setting goals. Go, oh, next year is going to be better. Here comes my goals. So just talk a little bit about, you can go any direction you want, because I want to hear like the depth of this. When you're at that point, like how can you really be intentional and not just like set the traditional goals? Or do you like setting the traditional goals? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I like to go deeper and not set traditional goals. 
So the, the science will tell us only 8% of people who set goals actually achieve them. Hmm. Wow. And yet, so 92% of people don't achieve goals. And yet we continue talking about smart goals, hmm. right? And like the theme of this is innovation. Right. And yet, why are we still doing things that don't work Insane. in the business world? If we did something that failed 92% of the time, like even in the baseball world, you suck. Right. right? Like, right. Yeah. And you can fail a lot in and baseball. You feel, and you feel a lot in baseball and softball and you suck. Right. But yet we keep on doing this. So what happens is people who set goals, especially like you said, Jenny, the external ones, mm-hmm. those are looking at the scoreboard. Right. Oh, okay. Well, I want to do this. I want to do that. I'll do that. Okay. That's necessarily not bad, but it's not, that's not by itself going to work. Right. Because you're only looking at the scoreboard. So you walk on the field and you say, well, I want to win five to two. And then you just sit there. And you're like, well, you got to actually play the game, right? right? right like you right, got to right. practice, right. Right. you got to like develop yourself. And yeah. so part of that is where, especially right now and in general, people who need to get started, the accomplishment, the goal, the scoreboard looks so big mm-hmm. and you get excited and you're like, yes, I can't wait to do this. Be a millionaire, set a business to help sign a thousand people, whatever it is. And then the next day you wake up and you're like, ooh, yeah, I, I should probably, maybe I shouldn't have done that, right? Like that's too hard to do. I don't know what to do next. And so part of that now is that is what I call a bridge to change. And that's around creating daily disciplines. Hmm. Now, those are small, intentional actions that you take every day that develop yourself into the person you want to become. And so that is where the, really the magic happens. And so as we think about goal setting, right, there, it is good. It is good to set goals, look at the scoreboard that we want to win. We want to win a championship. We want to be a Hall of Famer. But what did you do each and every single day, right? Like you woke up early, you worked out, you trained, you hit, you fielded, you eat healthy, you studied film, like you put in the daily disciplines it took to accomplish that goal. And I think what I find, at least with myself, it happened too, is like, I wanted to achieve all these big things, but I didn't know the first step I needed to take. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And so what it actually means is like looking at yourself and say, what is one small action I can take today? I love that. And that has purpose behind it. I love that because that's definitely what we teach in our Next Level Evolution program. Because with New Year's resolutions or, you know, new month resolutions or new week resolutions or new day resolutions. Starting on Monday. Everybody has that big goal, you know. Okay, I want to lose 30 pounds. I'm using the typical weight loss thing because people can relate to that. I want to lose X amount of weight, whatever, whatever. Right. And it's like, oh, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop doing this. So it's, it's for me, it's, it's portraying some kind of, of energy or vibe of, of deprivation of restriction, you know, and it's like, okay, yes, you're doing that for an extended amount of time, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You keep on doing this yo-yo thing. And like you said, it's like, what can you do daily? Because when people ask me, what's the best diet? I tell people the one you can do consistently, you know, what's the best workout, the workout you can do consistently, because if you figure that out, if you find that out, when it's time to, to work out or eat or whatever, you're not going to be like, fuck, this sucks. I don't want to do this. You're going to be like, yes, whatever. We were at this virtual conference for the past three days. The other night didn't end to like nine or 10. So after that, I'm in the other room, like working out at 11 o'clock, not because I had to per se, but because I wanted to, you know, because I know for me, working out helps me do all the other things I love doing. It helps me ride better. It, It gives me more strength and stamina on the paddleboard, you know? (laughs) <laughs> swimming today <laughs> gives you more stamina doing that. So that helps me in other areas of my life. So I don't mind doing it no matter the time. And, but it's like little actions, little things. People think they have to do this huge, big thing. You know, I, I have to cut out sugars. I have to, you know, I have to work out an hour and a half. No, what can you do consistently? What can you do consistently? Let's start there. Let's start with a step. And once you get that one step, then you follow with the other step. Next thing you know, you're walking. If you can walk long enough, then you run. Then you run long enough, you can sprint. So yes, what is that small action? I'm not asking you to change your life tomorrow, but I want you to change your life. And the way that you do this is by taking that small action. And and what is that? Which kind of goes back to the, like, what do you want? Like the dreaming, who are you? 
so accurate. But what you find is like people always look at like the external goal, right? We'll mm-hmm. lose 40 pounds. Yep. And if you lost the 10, you're, you're a failure. You're right. like, whoa, wait a minute here, right? Like, or like a good example is people who want to who want to run a 5K, and that's the definition of success if I ran if I finish the 5K. Mm-hmm. But that's not the way our brains work. And so what we should be focusing on is like, did I work out today? Did I put my shoes on today and at least did something? Yes. Right. And if so, that's the momentum building yep. that will get me to, to run a 5K. Right. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the runner's high, right? Like that that's a thing. Yeah, but yeah. The, the success should be tied to did I get in the gym today? Even though it's 11 o'clock at night, I have a good why and purpose behind it. Did I get in there? And maybe I didn't get an hour and a half in there, but I got 20 minutes. Right. You know, I, and that's, I did something. that's success. Mm-hmm. You did something, right? And so there's a, a science and concept called hedonic theory. And it really goes back to our brains are wired this way. And our brains are wired to avoid pain and seek pleasure. Hmm. And it's not surprising. And so in this situation is what, what I teach and what you guys teach, obviously, is momentum building, right? Like yeah. our brains are wired to want to seek the pleasure. But if we have the pleasure being the 5K, which we're not going to hit for six months, then we have to grind yep. for six months with no success, no wins, no momentum building to get there, to get one runner's high. And it's like, no, that's not the way our brains are wired. Define success differently. The goal is still good, but define success that I went to the gym at 11 o'clock at night check it off the list because that's what mattered. Even if I did five minutes, 10 minutes, like I still have that little habit I created to go to the gym because that's the lifestyle is important to me. That moved me closer to that goal instead of away. You know, yes. you know what, what, what I used to do too with clients who had this big goal of losing weight, you know what I'm saying? I, I need to lose 20, 30, 40 pounds, right? And then they'd be like, oh my God, I only lost 10 pounds, right? So what I would do was I was like, hey, pick up this 10 pound dumbbell, walk to the other wall, walk back, and then put it down. And they're like, holy shit. I was like, yes, you just put a 10 pound plate down and you're walking around 10 pounds lighter. Think about that. Oh, that's a good example. I love it. Yeah. And they finally have the awareness that like they like get it, that like they've been carrying this weight yep. on their shoulders the whole time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Defining success differently. It's, oof, I love that, Jay. I'm just dying to know something here, right? Okay, so I'm like, all right, he's a high performance coach. He teaches these principles. He teaches people how to create momentum. He teaches about being intentional and I'm sure much more. So what I'm dying to know is, okay, you're at this point, you want to make the change or you want to do the thing. How can people really identify what those habits are, right? Because like when they come to us, we help them identify those habits, can, do you feel like people can come to the clarity of what that thing is that they can do every day to get them to that goal, to get them to that dream, to get them? It's a great question that I think the answer is it depends. Mm-hmm. It depends on the maturity of the person. It depends on how clear they actually are in their goals. A lot of people, not surprising, are ex-athletes I work with because you know we all have that mentality. We know how to do the practices. Right. So to answer your question, what happens is when they first set their first what I call daily disciplines, I say, you know what, instead of doing 10, why don't we just look at three? Mm-hmm. And with three, why don't we just look at one, small ones, right? That. Like drink, drink a gallon of water a day or, hey, pick up a book for five minutes, right? I'm not looking to read a book a week. I'm looking at, can I just read for five minutes? Can I start to build this? Because that momentum will build. They, they'll start to get some success. They'll like the book they're reading and they'll start to read 20, 30 minutes and they'll create a habit, which is what they want to do. And so what I try to teach is, hey, start out small, which most people do. They take a huge bite. Yep fail after two or three weeks, I'm like, I'm done. come back. And then they say, Hey, let me shrink this down for you. And they're like, Oh, okay. Now I get the momentum, which I wish they would just listen to the beginning, but you know, <laughs> people, people are people, which is why you guys, you know, this is why this is what yeah. you, I'm sure you guys live this too. <laughs> Do you feel like there is, I don't this could be like a trick question. I'm not sure, but like, do you feel like there's a driving factor or a reason behind why people want to do that all or nothing method? Like, why is that what their go-to is, even though people like you are like, no, 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 just take the small bite. Like, why do you think that exists? Why do I think that people take the big bite? I have two thoughts on this. First is I think as people get really excited because they see the big goal, they're like, okay, I need to get there tomorrow. And they're like, that's not really how life works, but you know, we could, we could definitely try, right? There's no overnight success. Took me seven years to get here, you know, like that kind of thing. So one, I think people get excited and, and can't break it down small enough. And the second is, and I think this is where you were alluding to earlier, Jenny, is that you know 
people get so narrowly focused on that one thing. If I am just a millionaire, then I will have success in my mm-hmm. life. Yeah. You know, if I'm just an all American athlete, if I just get drafted, I will have, I will be successful. And that's, that's the wrong approach. That's not healthy. Right. And so one of the things that is forced in my book, and I think you guys talk about it in your programs too, is like the more holistic life, Mm -hmm. right? Like if I'm so focused on being a millionaire and I work 16, 18 hours a day, my opinion is your, your marriage probably sucks. Yeah. (laughs) You probably don't know your kids. Right. Like you're missing out on everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And so to what extent, like, so you can be rich. Yeah. And so I think that's, I think people get into that focus of, okay, this is really why I started in the books. I wanted to be rich or I wanted to have a healthy lifestyle or I wanted to get married. And then they'll put all the, the focus on there. And part of me is saying, Hey, well, hold on here. The goal is to put acceleration in all areas of our mm-hmm. life because we want to be well-rounded people because that's how we're wired to be mm-hmm. well-rounded. Let's, mm-hmm. let's, let's take a step back, take a little pause, relax a little bit and like, we'll get there, you know, that kind of thing. And I think some of it too is driven by like culture and society. It's driven by corporate America. I'm just going to say it because as much as we love some of these companies that really help us live an easier life, the culture that exists in a lot of them is very much like, what have you done for me lately? And how can you work more? And how can you breathe more? And oh my God, the first one in, the last one out and all of those standards. And it's always boggled me like, why is it like this? You know, like we're humans, you know, like we, but we just get into these machine type modes that has us being so like, like some people are like, I'm so busy. I can't even go to the bathroom. Like that's, that's not okay. (laughs) Like that's not okay. Which then I think leads into like this, like laser focus, because sometimes you have to be so laser focused in your career or whatever. And I think some of it, has been trained because I've been like untraining myself from some of my corporate habits since I left in January. It's like been a shedding of layers because it's just been so ground into me. Can you give me an example? Okay. So like working and not wanting to stop. That's one example. I would say just being so hardcore about For us having a business as well, like another example is like us having a business and there is a huge creative side to the business. So just being a sales rep and just carrying out that one aspect of a business, you're expected to make 10 to 12 calls a day and you're expected to close X amount of sales. So it's very like regimented. And I try to bring that regimen into our business and Jay's like, whoa, hold up. (laughs) (laughs) Slow your roll. (laughs) We got other shit to do. Like, so just really just like chilling out and being able to tap into more of like the creative aspect that I think would have even helped me in corporate America, but I was so like, I gotta get it done. Does that make sense? Was that a good? Yeah, totally. And that's just sort of like more, 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 more. And you're like, well, hold on. What, whatever happened to the deep thinking? Right. Like whatever happened to the creatives being able to have some space to like simply think about things because it's all about like, go, 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 go. Yeah. And yes, people want to be innovative, right? Innovation, innovation, speed, fast. But it's like, well, hold on. Let's like, I love Apple's approach to it. Let, let's pause and like think deeply about what the consumer actually wants right. versus like just pushing stuff out there quickly. And so, you know, that's sort of like the example I look as a startup side, but I can, I get the example of the corporate world too. It's just like, you got to keep on producing or like, what have you done for me lately? Will? Big time, big time. And that's why a lot of salespeople sandbag, right? If they did really well for yes. the year, they could have maybe blown it out even more, but that means next year they're screwed because now they have to beat the quadruple sales that they did. And then it's like, well, shit. I'm going to make all the money this year and make nothing next year. And then I'm going to be fired, yeah. you know, yeah. as one example, uh, salespeople live that roller coaster <laughs> for sure. I think it's just interesting all around in reframing, reconditioning, deprogramming all these things that have us feeling we have to move a certain way. It was interesting. We just finished up with one of our clients who did a 60 day trial of our, our program. And her testimonial was like, coming in, I was skeptical, you know, because they said I could do things I still wanted to do. Like I didn't have to eat boiled chicken and green beans or I didn't have to work out three times a week. And if I didn't want to do squats, I didn't have to do squats. So I was very skeptical to start this. But like after going through it and actually seeing results, I'm enlightened I'm empowered. And so it's, it's, it's interesting because it's like, I've done all the things. And my question is, you've done all the things. You continue to do all the things. 
So why not try doing something totally different? And it's like, well, but no, this says I'm, I'm, I have to do it this way. And it's like, how is that working out for you? How has that worked out for you? Apparently you're here still looking for the result you've been looking for for the past 15 years. So how has all that worked? Let's, let's try something different. And like you said, let's just take a step. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. You're not asking me to run? No. <laughs> just take a step. That's all. I, I just want you to step today. That's all I want you to do. Just step. So with him saying that, I, I, I can't help myself. I have another big question. Okay. So I'm thinking peak performance coach. And after what I just talked about, about being hardcore in like a corporate America setting, when I think peak performance, I think I better like fucking run through walls, right? I'm thinking I'm going to be working 12 hours a day and rah. And then, you know, we're talking about taking these little steps. So I would love to hear from a peak performance coach, an expert, how do you take perfection, A-driven, that sports type mentality where you're like, ah, and move them into that intentional day? Yeah, I love that question. I think there's the idea that I have to go, 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 or I'm not driven enough. I don't have big enough goals. I'm not going to get there. And I think it's just completely false. Like I'm a very driven person, but I don't work a hundred hours a week. I, I, I rarely work more than 60 probably because to me, I have my priorities in line. And part of that is my family. Mm-hmm. And part of that is a lifestyle that we're trying to build where it is weekends off. It is, you know, going to uh, on vacation or just having a quiet Saturday morning with my family. Like, right. And so for me, you can still accomplish really big things and you can still be really, really driven. And I think that you don't have to be that like, go through the wall, you know, uh, kind of raw, raw person. <laughs> right. And I, I like, that's not me. I don't like it. I get on Instagram, I scroll right by it. And it's like, <laughs> gosh, this fallacy in the world that you got to go hard yeah. to be successful. It's just yeah. wrong. I don't believe it. I'm so glad that you don't because I love that individually we can change the world and together we can move mountains. Right. And I would love anybody who's listening to this to like share this podcast episode with your friends, share this with everybody, you know, because the more people that can realize that it doesn't have to be that way, especially if that's what you look around and that's all you see, just to know that there's another way. Working smarter and not harder is a real thing. It is possible. But almost at the same time, I feel like that's a little cliche. Like it's true, but I feel like people have started to say it enough. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, no, you know? I, I, I'm once again, I agree to disagree. <laughs> it's kind of like when someone tells you to eat slower and you've never experienced eating slow. It's like eat slow. What the hell does that mean? So like working smarter, not harder. For me, it's like. Hard work means sun up to sun down. Go, 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 go. I don't have time to go to the bathroom. And you know, what have you done? You've checked off a lot of things on the list, but like out of all that busy work, what did you really get done? And like working smarter means like, okay, this project needs to move this week. So if this project needs to move this week, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. This needs to be done. So out of those three things, what can I do today to move this forward to the next thing for tomorrow? What do you think, Ryan? Oh, I agree 100%. I have a, a story around that. So people think to be successful, you got to work all these hours. Well, one of my good friends owns Chick-fil-A and he's a high riser in Chick-fil-A and like he has one of the top stores and they love him there. And Ooh, I cool. love the guy. He's awesome. Awesome. But he also has six kids. And so he only works probably about 12 hours a week at his store. Awesome. Because to him, success is not defined by the money that he gets and that the recognition of being a Chick-fil-A owner is. Right. But he's a really, his kids and developing his kids is a very deep passion for his, for him. And so he, he now has built systems to work smarter. So that way that money can fund the lifestyle it is. Mm -hmm. So he can spend more time with his kids and really develop his kids. And so people think you got to go and make a bunch of money, but that, that's not what I'm saying. Is like, how do you define success? What do you, like we went back to the beginning of the episode, what do you actually want? Yeah. You want to be a great parent or you want to be a great spouse or be a great neighbor? And like that may look differently, but right. that's mm-hmm. wonderful. Right. And then like, let's be intentional of how do we, how do we get there? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like 80 hours a week, corporate America, 120 hours a week. Got to say, yes. It's like, well, hold on. That's just a vehicle that funds where I really want to go. I love that. And it just reminds me too, like you, we were saying about the holistic approach and really just thinking about all aspects. And I think one of the biggest things that people who are, who feel potentially stuck 
in these environments where they are working the 80, 60, 80, 100, whatever, like just going nonstop is boundaries. But I think it's really yeah. tough sometimes for those people to understand and really embrace boundaries and how to put them in place. How do you work with boundaries if you even do work with boundaries with your clients? Maybe you have a whole different, different technique. Boundaries are hard. <laughs> people don't like boundaries. <laughs> I'm a big believer in it though. And, you know, so we have two like rules as a family. Sundays are like family time. So I won't be on Instagram. A lot of times I just have my phone off because mm-hmm. my family's there. So any emergency happens, it's not really an emergency. And then the second thing is Monday nights is always our night for dinner. So no activities, no sports, no anything. And so we're just like, that is a priority. So everything else gets scheduled around that. And that's how I set boundaries a little bit. There's a great book, Boundaries by Henry Cloud. And then he has a Boundaries for Leaders book. And it's fantastic, actually. Mm. So it takes the idea of boundaries for the personal life, but takes it into the corporate world of how Ooh, to be a leader and I set good you. boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's really powerful. I just tried on what you said, like really quick mentally, like turning the phone off on Sundays. You said it and I was like, that's cool. And then I was like, wait, is it? Is it really cool? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going through this mental process and it's like, okay, what am I really doing on Sundays anyway to have the phone on? Like, you know, and I guess that's a, that's the kind of initial shock for some things, but it's, it's kind of goes back to what we were talking about. That doesn't have to be, like you said, the scoreboard, like the scoreboard is, is not being disturbed on a Sunday, but I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Okay. So why don't you just turn the phone on silent? Let's start there. I got a mind bender. Maybe, hopefully. So what if the scoreboard that you put out there, what if the scoreboard is just how much fun you're having? And so if you want a scoreboard and that's what drives you, what if the scoreboard is just like keeping score of how much fun you're having? I, I, I think I know where you're going, but go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I, for some people that still might be like the thing like, oh, cause you're talking about an A type. Oh, uh, I didn't have X amount of fun. So it's still taking those little actions for the scoreboard. That's a good point. He always brings it around. What do you, do you have anything you want to add, Ryan? One of the things that I try to do is I, I took the happiness course at Yale. Uh huh. It's the Udemy one. That's yes. free. I did not get into Yale, but it's a wonder. Have you taken it? <laughs> is it the one with the female teacher and she goes through? Yes. The, yes. I loved it. Oh, so I loved good. It. And I did it through Coursera. So I did it through a different way. So they have it a couple of different okay. Yeah, it's, it was awesome. One of the things that really resonated with me, the idea of savoring. Mm-hmm. And for me, as a person who's like a type A, like what's next, what's next, what's next, savoring allowed me to pause and like feel the five senses of the moment. And so now like if I'm having like a wonderful moment or if I'm having like warm coffee on a patio hmm. or having a beer with a buddy and it's like an jo- enjoyable moment, it's like I'll pause and try to like just be in the moment. Right. And Lock so for in. me, that's like, yeah, instead of like the joy on the scoreboard, for me, that's like, oh, I need to, I need to savor. And so I actually created daily disciplines, try to try to savor three or four times a week, just to start to like feel myself mm-hmm. like getting that trigger to say, hey, I need to like enjoy this moment right now. Because like, that's that's sort of what the whole point is, right? Like, right. I'm still moving in the right direction. But I also like I should enjoy the journey. Because there is no end. Right. So anyways, that's one of my things is, is the savoring. I'm getting major chills, which is good. It's a confirmation. And it it also, I feel like that really fuels the fulfillment and helps contribute to the overall fulfillment where it helps you to step out of that laser focus on one aspect of your life and be able to, like you said, like bring amazingness to all aspects because you are, I've got so many thoughts clashing in my head right now. <laughs> They're all like colliding, like boom, 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 like all these like fireworks. But I just feel like it just really feeds into the peace, into the fulfillment of being a human, of being a high performance person, of being able to create experience, step into the life that you visioned for yourself. Who are you? Are you asking? No, it's just in general, not you. I was like, whoa, left um, field. Yeah. I'm asking the audience. (laughs) <laughs> there's like two examples i'll give you a chance to thank jenny and I'll, I'll tell two kind of short stories one is about leadership of actually stepping back and so my second my third company we had another startup but i got to be a founding team member with two guys who were big time executives at public companies and we got to do it together so i got to learn a lot of leadership stuff but one story they kept on saying about like the lifestyle is that the old ceo at sprint back in the 90s would take 
he would literally take a whole month off of vacation. Wow. And running a public company that's high growing would take a month off. And he did it for two things. One, he said that it allowed him to deeply think about the business in a way different way after that, like wiring of your brain kind of slows down. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that, he's like, if anything happened, like it, it's a great chance for the people I'm leading to actually step up. That's awesome. And, it's a, and it shows me who's going to step when I'm not there because I should not be required. Right. I should not be required. And if I am, that means I probably don't have the right people around that me. That is awesome. And I was like, oh, that always, yeah, it always stuck with me. Like, oh, that's yeah. actually a way different definition of success than having yes. to work 120 hours. Yep. Yes. I know so many leaders that need to hear that. I mean, like I said, this this is a podcast that you share with everybody because there's so many nuggets that could really unlock someone's brain and help them to really live an even better life. Because right there, I thought of like five people who could hear that one nugget of information about having a different focus because so many managers, so many leaders feel like they have to be there. That's that's innovative within itself. Or, I mean, it kind of should be. It actually should be standard. And I'm I'm kind of thinking like with a system like that, you're setting up a legacy for your company because you always have someone who could step in. So, you know, you don't have to worry about like, oh, well, Benny's not trained. So, you know, I guess the company's going down the toilet. There's always someone to step in and to step up to the the challenge, which is awesome and amazing. And I feel like as a leader, too, it would show you, like you said, not only which leaders maybe need to go, but maybe where training or where systems or where automations or whatever need to come into place to support. It'll really, I would think with a month off or however much time off where you literally just unplug and you are not available, you'll know really quick what needs to be built out in your company that maybe wasn't as strong as you thought it was, people or systems. And as entrepreneurs, right, we like to do everything ourselves and we're always the best at it. And sometimes we need to give over control. That's a great chance to let somebody else step up and actually let them thrive on their own. Mm -hmm. So you can actually build a business that you probably dreamed of building. You didn't want to work 220 hours. You wanted to be a business owner with freedom. But yet, how, how, why are we here doing this? And so like, that's another piece of it too. It allows the next person up to kind of step up and run it, which is kind of a cool thing. You're developing that next round of leaders. I know. This has been awesome. I mean, there's been so many aha moments. So Ryan, so someone's listening, they're getting really excited. What are the different ways that you work with people? Yeah, so I have a book. So all these thoughts and the science is into my my book. I have an intentional day program, which is a quarterly program where I will actually help you set your daily disciplines, Ooh. set your habits, set your goals, and like because people need help. Mm-hmm. And then I have a leadership academy for businesses. And I am wrestling with the idea of having a mastermind, but I'm Ooh. not I'm not quite there yet. Dun, dun, so. dun. Dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, if you guys are like, oh my God, I love this. And I'm like super excited for what Ryan's talking about. And you want to get connected. What's the best way to get connected with you? My website or Instagram. Okay. So the website is theintentionalday.com or Instagram where I post a lot of this stuff. And it's ryan.performancecoach. So all I'm thinking is, you know, that mastermind, if that really rung in your, in your head and you're like, oh my God, I want to be a part of something like that. I want to, I want to be around Ryan's energy. I want to really just really thrive and have this amazing life. You know that, you know, when, when we're entrepreneurs and we've got these ideas, nothing kicks them into gear besides a bunch of people being like, I'm in, I'm interested. I want (laughs) more. So if you want to hear more about that, like, you know, with him going, oh, I'm toying with the idea. If that's something that interests you, make sure you reach out to him because then that will. That will further that along in the process. <laughs> uh, for sure. I know like if you reach out to us and you're like, I'd love to hear this. We'd be like, oh, that sounds good. Let's let me put that in place. Yeah. We're kind of making it up as we go. You know, like I think people want this. I don't know. Right. Right. And then, you know, you test the I kind of want to do it. <laughs> right. It <Yeah>. sounds cool. <laughs> it sounds fun for me to do. I, I'm be happy to do that. Well, masterminds are great because we were just talking about this. We're in a business mastermind and it's coming up on the year because it was a year commitment. And. We were talking like, okay, what do we want to do? What are our next steps? And one of the biggest things that you really can't, there's no value because it's like one of those things like with the commercials where it's like, this costs this, this costs this, this is, what is the word? Valueless, valuable, valuable. Priceless. Priceless. Thank you. So it's kind of like that because like the people that we have met in the mastermind are worth the weight in gold as the actual mastermind. 
because they're the ones that can help unlock doors. And, you know, they're your lifelong friends. They end up becoming these people that when you travel to those places in the world, you're like, oh, my God, you know, I love the idea of a mastermind because I, I think they're powerful. And it opens up whole new ground and ideas or things you haven't even thought of or, you know, take your idea and, and hit it from a totally different angle. So, yeah, masterminds are awesome. I know we're trying to land the plane, but one of my favorite like things to talk about is around growth partners or like the five people you hang out with yes. most, like matter mm-hmm. the most. And Jay, you alluded to this earlier, but like in the mastermind and for you guys, for that business mastermind is like the people who are like, like thinkers who are the same level as you, there's science around like how important they, they are to your success and to where you want to go which we don't need to get into all the science of it, but other than like let the audience who's hearing this, like be intentional about those five people you hang out with most Yep. because they really do matter a lot Mm -hmm. to where you're going. A lot. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, look, seriously, sit with that for a second. Just sit with that for a second. Think of who those five people are you talk to most. And especially when shit hits the fan and especially when things are tough. Because just imagine, we are grateful we don't have those people. I can just imagine, though, with us getting a business off the ground and getting it up and rolling this year, pandemic hits. If our five people were people who had totally different thoughts about the world or negative perspectives or non like a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, we might have already folded. We might have already thought everything was doom and gloom versus the people you're surrounding yourself with helping to challenge you to think bigger to you know helping you not to go down that ditch (laughs) like when you're spiraling out and even you know apple just launched like five new products this year like anything is possible (laughs) it doesn't matter what's going on anything is possible five people really think about that and take it and i'll and i'll ask you too because you called them growth partners is there a reason why you called them growth partners yeah i don't like the i don't like task and i don't like the word accountability okay because it seems like you either do or you don't, right? Like you either show up to the meeting so you get you get praise, or you show you didn't show up to the meeting and you get a stick, you get you get punishment, right? Like pays, and that's like not. I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I like momentum building. So I saw a growth partner, somebody who who are peers with you that you guys grow together. I like that, and and that's why I use the word growth partners because you're partnering together for growth, not holding each other accountable and saying you didn't do this, you should have made it here, right? That's too hmm. aggressive for me. I like that. Versus thinking. like, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like your, your growth partners could be come in the form of a mentor? The way I do in the book, probably not, but the five people you hang out with, you should have a mentor there. Oh, so there's two different. So there's the growth partners and then the five people you hang out with. Yeah. Break that down again. Cause I missed it. And if I missed it, maybe other people did, or maybe I'm crazy, but so what's the difference between the growth partner and the five people you hang out with? Yeah. So a growth partner is somebody who you've committed to do like growth with. And so in the context of probably for your business, you guys are the growth partner for your clients. In the context of my business is like the the book facilitates two people to do it together who are peers and, or they're friends and they're doing it together. Got so it. that's like a growth partner. And the idea there is that here's what the science will tell us. If you just set goals by yourself, again, 8% chance to achieve. If you set goals and tell it to somebody one time, like a boss or something, you have a 65% chance to achieve that goal. Wow. So better, but not that good. But if you have a recurring scheduled meeting to talk about those goals with somebody else, you have a 95% chance to achieve those goals. Ooh, I like that. And so it goes from eight to 95 just by having somebody to talk to. So that's a growth partner. And then the five people you hang out with most are people you're associating with. I think Jay alluded to it about, you know, as you started growing, right? The friends weren't the mm-hmm. same and you needed to level up and all that stuff. Like those are the five people you're hanging out with. Those are your masterminds. Got it. Yeah. I merged the two. I was thinking that you were calling those the growth partners. Oh, you could, I guess. And the way I teach my book, I don't, but you can take it however you want. I don't care. You're like, hey, whatever <laughs> helps you fly. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Ryan's hey, like, whatever's going to get you from eight to 95, let's do it. That's right. I don't care what you call it. Just do it. Right. That's a good point. Just no more TiVo. Get those That's five. Right. No more TiVo. Get the growth partner. Step into a mastermind, change your life. That's right. Guys, definitely look Ryan up on Instagram. Definitely get the book because there's been a lot of gems 
not the place you work out, but the jewels <laughs> today. And Ryan's just an all around cool guy from Kansas City. Anything else you want to share, Ryan? As we part depart, you got all these cool stories. So like I'm I'm definitely making a reason to come to Kansas City. Right, I don't drink beer, but we can like I'll I'll drink We a have coffee. barbecue. You like yes. barbecue? Hey. Let's do it. We have the best barbecue. Yes. We can do a little tour. You'll start sweating out meat and it'll be a great thing. Oh, that <laughs> we're, just we're sounded weird, but we're still coming. We're, we're going to Kansas City. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You you had me at barbecue. Ryan has been awesome. We'll see you on the next episode. Mahala. Hey. You can subscribe to the Holistic Life podcast from your favorite streaming platform. And don't forget to check out 2jhala.com to stay in the know as an official 2JH insider. Mahala for tuning in. And until next time, that's our show.